The Turtle Room, Education, Conservation, Survival. Before I begin talking about my experience, I think it's appropriate to go over um, just what some attributes of Madagascar and some stuff, just facts, and go over some of the species native there. So Madagascar is the land of, as you can see, lemurs, colonians, and vanilla ice cream. Uh, and the reason ice is in parentheses is because if you order dessert there, uh, they give you what's called ice cream, but it's just ice, or it's just cream and it's cold. Um, and so that's what ice cream is there. And it's kind of interesting. I didn't expect that. Um, the island is actually about as large as Texas, which is very surprising. Uh, it's the fourth largest island in the world. Um, it's it's, oh, it's 227,000 square miles and about 1,000 miles long. So it's a very, very large island. Uh, and so um, let's, uh, let's, Colonians in Madagascar, uh, Malagasy history uh, and in the history of Madagascar. Um, an interesting thing a lot of people may not know is that there actually have been a lot of giant tortoise species uh, native to Madagascar. In just the past, um, in just the past around 2.6 million years, um, since the start of the Pleistocene, uh, there have actually been two species that have gone extinct, uh, Dipsichelys abrupta and Dipsichelys grandidieri, um, and those are the two that have gone extinct since then. Uh, and there have been many more before that, uh, that's what we assume. Uh, and so it, there's kind of this general, this theory, uh, and there are many others, um, but that um, Dipsa Kelly's or Robert Kelly's, uh, depending on what classifications uh, you agree with, um, are kind of the, the Madagascar is kind of the birthplace of both kind of lineages of tortoises, the Cylindraspis, um, that inhabited the masquerades. And you can see uh, in the corner over there, that is a picture, uh, an illustration of uh, Cylindraspis vosmerai on the Mascarene Islands. Um, and in, in 1630s, um, a, a captain that visited said they were so numerous on the island that you could walk on their backs for miles uh, without touching the ground. And by 1750, they were extinct. Um, so uh, just it's pretty, it's pretty shocking. But it's believed that Madagascar kind of was the birthplace of those. Uh, so species kind of gave rise to those. And also to Dipsa Kelly's uh, Gigantiara, Dobrik Kelly's, and the, in the Seychelles. So um, the colonials of Madagascar currently, um, there are currently, well, technically 14 species. Um, the, the 14th, the, um, the African, the, the brown mud turtle. Uh, there are very, very few reports from the island, so I don't include it in the review. Uh, but it has been reported there, potentially because of human introduction. <coughs> Um, and so they, there are technically eight spe or nine species, including the brown mud turtle, uh, that live on the island, and then five more sea turtles that visit and nest. Um, and so I'm going to go through a quick review of sort of the, the eight major ones. And the platypus <coughs> tortoise, or the Angonica, as it is called in Madagascar, uh, it, as you can see, it's native to a very small range um, in uh, Nosy or in uh, Bali Bay. Uh, and there was actually a national park dedicated to just the tortoise. Uh, it was the first of its type um, dedicated to an animal, a specific animal uh, for conservation in Madagascar. So that was kind of a milestone, um, and Darrell kind of pioneered, Darrell Wildlife pioneered that. Um, and it's also the second rarest turtle as of 2017 um, on the uh, red list um, of, of turtles and tortoises. So the spider tortoise, another very iconic species, split into three subspecies, and you can see on the map, um, just really restricted to the coast, and another species that is highly traded, um, and it trade uh, kind of spiked with about uh, 3,000 plus animals going out um, from Malagasy markets in around 2000 and 2001, um, and it's Appendix 1. And, uh, and then, so the Ma Malagasy big-headed turtle, a uh, very interesting species of turtle. It's native to a pretty, a pretty decent-sized range on the island. Um, and it's believed to be, uh, it's the only old world polyknoidid turtle. Um, and so I believe there are eight different species that are native to South, uh, South America. Um, and this is the only one that's actually very far away. Um, and it's believed that at some point, uh, somewhere a little bit past 77 million years, it came out in a study very recently uh, that this, this animal crossed when everything was kind of connected uh, and made its way to Madagascar and it diverged uh, a long time ago from its, its normal crop. Um, 
And so the flat-tailed spider tortoise, another species native to a very restricted range, uh, but a very interesting animal, uh, just a very interesting looking uh, tortoise, and very cool. Uh, it's the Madagascan hingeback tortoise, and this is a really uh, fascinating tortoise, I think. Um, it, it's, the, it's a very, very rare species, only estimated to be about 5,000 or fewer uh, left in the wild. And um, it, it's native to an island actually off the coast of Madagascar. Um, and that's called uh, nosy folly. And it, it's interesting, there's no conservation that I, I'm, I'm aware of going on for this species. Um, and it's, it's interesting that it's actually in sort of a, a bad situation. And it's a subspecies of, uh, based on the uh, Canixis conservation blueprint, it's a subspecies of Zombensis. And there are, uh, along the coast of, uh, of actual of Africa, there is uh, the nominant um, subspecies Zombensis Zombensis, but this is Zombensis dormoigue, um, but that is native to the island. So another uh, very interesting turtle. The yellow-bellied mud turtle, uh, it's um, actually native to a, a pretty decent extent of the island, and uh, it kind of covers the range there, and possibly introduced by humans. Uh, same thing with African helmeted terrapin. Uh, another one that was actually split uh, in 2014, they split this from one species that pretty much covered all of Africa, uh, and they split it into, uh, I, I believe, nine, and then in a later study, uh, made two subspecies out of the nine. Uh, and so this is just a nominant one. And so the radiated tortoise, and that's going to bring me to really um, why I was in, why I was on the island, and sort of my journey there. Um, and as you can see, a brief introduction. The range, um, and, and this is interesting, very interesting. So um, these ranges are all from the 2017 uh, Turtle and Tortoise Checklist, um, and the range of this species, um, as of the first review of of the range, actually extended farther than the map does uh, on here, or very close to where the map uh, ends on the screen. Uh, and in just, I, I believe, around 45 years, it's it's already greater than 50% reduced, uh, just from poaching and con consumption. So, so the trade in the radiated tortoise, and that's what brought me to the island, uh, and that's what drove the confiscation. Um, and I'm gonna, these are just some statistics um, of, of confiscations in previous years, but I'm gonna start to go through these pictures, and these are some, uh, I think, somewhat disturbing pictures, but it kind of conveys the image of what we're facing in this, in this country um, and the situation that's present. And just this first photo uh, of the tortoise is just packed in a suitcase. Um, when, when we walked on the plane, this is an interesting story, there was a man uh, carrying a stick and he, he, he just had this stick, it was taped up, it looked like uh, it could have anything in it, it was hollow. Um, and he walked up to the, the people working at the airport, the uh, security, and he handed it to the guy uh, and said a few words and the security guy took the stick. I, I mean, uh, it, it was right in front of the uh, security check, which is where they open your bag uh, or don't and just assume there's nothing in there. Um, but he just handed this guy a stick. Uh, there might have been a bribe going on, and, and later on we see that the guy just put the stick on the plane. Uh, no explanation. Same thing with these tortoises. Uh, they get on these planes pretty easy. And so this is another photo from the confiscation. Uh, very disgusting. Uh, you see there's tortoises even in the bathtub. Uh, it, it's just, I mean, that's not a place I would want to ever live. Uh, and so you can see they tape them like this. I mean. There have been reports of people taping tortoises to themselves and turtles to themselves, uh, and just they go into drastic measures to get these in. And so these are just some for sale, uh, possibly next to some other species there, Egyptian tortoises. And then this is actually from the most recent confiscation of about 7,000. Uh, and so uh, 11,000, and then very recently we had another confiscation of 7,000, um, and just, it shows the quantities of these animals. And so. Uh, the, this is just some in tubs. And then the next images I'm going to show, um, these are actually the second threat that we're really facing. And this may be the first audience to actually see these. Uh, they were taken only around two and a half weeks ago uh, and sent to me uh, by Josh Lucas, who's currently in the country uh, doing work. 
uh, with the species. Um, but this is kind of the poaching that's going on at the same time, uh, or not as, and, and the consumption by locals. And, and we have to realize that it is part of the local tradition there uh, to consume these animals. Uh, in history, it has been fady and it has been kind of prohibited by spiritual law. Um, but now it's sort of, uh, that, that law is kind of degrading. Uh, and in some places, it's not intact. And so this is, these are just some photos of uh, these animals being consumed in the wild and the second threat that we're really facing uh, in trying to, to help these animals uh, survive. Um, and so, yeah, they just take the, the ovaries and they just hang them when they're done. And, uh, we, but we do have to realize this is, it's powerful images, but this is part of their local culture there, and we can't be, uh, we, I don't believe that we should stop every consumption because they are uh, part of that culture. Um, so the confiscation. Um, nearly 11,000 animals were confiscated, um, and I'm sure many of you know, uh, they were rushed to village de Tortu. Um, and so this is where my journey comes in, um, and this is just how I went from this, uh, which is my school, um, to that. And uh, this was, um, and it started in a car at the mall, that sums it up. Um, I was at breakfast uh, and I contacted Jordan Gray, who was uh, kind of the main contact for it. And I said, you know, uh, my school year is pretty much coming to an end, my eighth grade year, I could come uh, and help with this. And this was in May, um, I could come help with this. And he said, well, you're close to San Diego Zoo, you're in California, uh, maybe you can ship us some supplies. And I said, I could come, I could probably make it there. And he, he said, okay, let's try and make it happen, and it did. So it's a pretty interesting story, but a lot of this happens just at the last minute, and it was um, worth it. So a lot of work and a little time, uh, and of course reading turtle books as well, because uh, you can't not do that on long plane rides. Um, and so the journey begins. So we started at LAX, um, and you can see uh, LAX is a, it's a large airport, um, and we took off, and after 10 hours is too short, it was 12 hours, a uh, 12 hour flight to Minnesota, and all of you are probably really confused, um, and that's okay. Um, we were supposed to go to, we were supposed to fly into Chicago, um, but we ended up circling for seven hours because uh, we had storm warnings and uh, landed at two in the morning um, at Minneapolis airport and there's me sleeping on a bench for two hours. Uh, and so, but that's part of the adventure, you know. Uh, and so we, we, made, um, we made drastic plans and we flew to Miami. Um, and we, we made it to London after, and then time to fly to South Africa, and that was the best flight, that was amazing. Uh, you fly over the whole, uh, really, continent, the continent of Africa, and uh, it's just, it's really, it's amazing. Um, uh, it's just, it's an amazing trip. And so, um, the work begins, we, we, we landed, uh, we landed in Antananarivo, or Tana, the capital, um, and we, we, we spent the night there, um, and it was kind of relaxing, and then we took off, and the planes are like taxis in Madagascar. They take you, um, they kind of, they have a set route, um, and they stick to that route, and it's not really like here where you go a specific place, and that's all. Uh, but we landed in one different area before flying <coughs> to Ifadi, which is where we were working. Uh, which is where the village de Tortu was, uh, and where we were doing our work. And so that took about a day, uh, and we landed in Ifadi around, uh, actually around nine at night, uh, because we fly into Tuliar, uh, which is where the confiscation took place, and um, we take a car, so it's about an hour car ride into Ifadi, and we're there about nine, we get some dinner and a nice ten hours of sleep, uh, so at least I'm half caught up on, on some sleep, which is nice. Uh, it's nice to finally, after a four day trip uh, to have some rest. And so um, you can see uh, the work begins and there are a few photos that aren't loading here, uh, but that's okay. Um, and uh, we, we start, we walk to the facility, it's about uh, two miles away. Uh, and so we, we take the, uh, the walk there, it's a, it's a nice walk. Uh, you see just all the people, they're, ev every, they're everywhere and, they're, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the people and my experience in a little bit. Um, but we get a briefing, a 20 minute briefing on what's going on, uh, how to do it, and we pretty much hit the ground running, that sums it up. Um, we, we start with health checks every day, it takes about three hours. Um, and it's, it's, the tortoises are all in five different pens uh, located um, at the VDT or Village Theater 2. Um, 
and we're going around and um, we're just checking all the tortoises. We're, um, we're um, just making sure they're all alive and healthy. Um, and that's what we're starting the day with, to break to lunch. Um, and then we come back and do whatever needs to get done pretty much, um, such as build things, uh, segregate pens a little more to make more room, um, s separate water, uh, fill up the water, feed the animals, and just we're doing everything while we're there. Um, and so some more photos aren't loading, but that's, that's okay. Um, we started to do a health check. Um, and then this is very interesting. Um, over the course of the confiscation, we're part of wave two. And um, it's about two and a half weeks after the confiscation on the night of April 10th. And we are only, it's about two and a half weeks, so we're only finding one to two deceased tortoises. Um, a day out of the out of about the 8,000 that we have at the facility uh, at that time because a thousand have already been shipped to Itempulu, which was the other facility they were uh, using. Um, and so one or two deceased tortoises about two weeks after the confiscation is, is a low death rate um, and it does show that we had an impact on the species which is very it's very interesting and good. Um, so, so mainly while I was there, I was uh, doing pretty much anything that I could. Um, some veterinary work, the stuff that I was uh, allowed to do, um, such as uh, just a bridling kind of, and doing some of the, the food. Um, and so, I did find one tortoise um, at one point that did look deceased. Um, it was very, it was hanging on to life, and we brought it in to the clinic. Uh, and we applied a little Doppler jelly, um, and we put the Doppler in, and about two and a half, three minutes later, uh, we hear a little And it sounds like that. That's what a tortoise heartbeat sounds like uh, in the Doppler. Um, and after three minutes, um, which is kind of a, a very sick tortoise, has a very slow heart rate uh, and slow metabolic rate, so, um, and it took a while, but we, it was still alive. Uh, so it was hanging on to life. Uh, it may have been euthanized, uh, but I hope that it could have recovered, and I hope that it, it did, and that it's still out there right now. And so, some of the unexpected finds, uh, it's um, sad that the scorpion didn't show up, but it was kind of, it was, I mean, it looks like a scorpion, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, but I flipped a rock and I found it, and so this was my favorite. This is the fi my favorite find that I didn't expect to see, um, uh, Leoheterodon, uh, so a speckled, a Madagascan speckled hog nose. Uh, really cool to see that next to a tortoise. It was digging up the eggs, so I had some mixed feelings about that. Um, but it was it was okay nonetheless. Um, just yeah. Uh, and so meeting the world's uh, uh, largest that we know of radiated tortoise, a 45 pound radiated tortoise, uh, and it was massive. Uh, so it was amazing. And so the people, they were amazing. The people were um, really. Uh, a very, it's a very loving culture there, um, and you, you can see some of these fo these photos. Um, I was definitely getting face paint. Jordan and I um, got got our face paint. Um, that was that was really. It was the the last day was some of the most fun I've had, um, and just the people are really loving. And after turning down their offers to buy things uh, from them about 20 times, they actually kind of give up. But at the same time, it was time to get home. Uh, but I, I could have stayed. I could still be there. That, that'd be nice. Um, but um, it, it, it concluded on Saturday. A large group left. Uh, we headed to the capital, Antananarivo. Uh, and we were out uh, and back home, uh, which was a two-day flight. So it was shorter than the one back. So you're not allowed to. And the, the, Big picture is the, the best one, but that's okay. Um, you're not allowed to leave without getting sick. Uh, I came down with a 105 degree fever after arriving back in the capital, um, and that wasn't fun. Uh, it, it was really painful, but it's now cool. I can talk about it. Uh, I survived. <laughs> um, the doctor walked in and he told me that Africa wasn't for uh, wusses, so I, I believed him. Um, <laughs> And so the things I brought back with me, and in any trip, um, I think the things you bring back are, are the, 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 really, that's the takeaway. Um, and I, I think this sentence really sums it up. Upon coming home, I have a completely new perspective on the world I live in. Um, and that sums up pretty much everything. Um, 
And there's kind of a list here, um, and it's just a list of the things that my perspective has kind of changed about, and that I have new uh, and new uh, perspectives about. So one, the animals. Um, I mean, just being part of, um, and this is not really a perspective change, but this is just kind of being part of something bigger. Um, helping the animals was, I mean, the most amazing part, uh, and knowing that I had an impact on the future for all those tortoises that are currently at Itimpulu, um, and, and they're, th that I had an impact on their survival. It's just amazing to think, sort of, that I had an impact on something bigger than myself, and bigger, um, and, and just really um, something that's very important in the survival of a, in a critically endangered species. Um, and so, that was really the most, the best part. Uh, but two, I have a completely new perspective on the people, and, and really, I, I think a lot of that love rubbed off on me. Uh, as I said, it's a very loving culture. Everyone loves, everyone loves you there. I mean, they're not scared to run up to you and, uh, and hug you and, and paint your face and braid your hair. Um, and, but but the, the people, they were amazing, and it's just so different. They, they are living in this, um, they're living in, in poverty, um, and and to see how much they they just love um, it's it's when you come back here and people complain it's just um, it's very different uh, and you just think these people really have a bad situation and they're making the best out of it uh, so it's really amazing and the environment and that's kind of everything that's covered here I mean the entire environment I have. Uh, a new picture, kind of standing in this room, I can uh, kind of put myself in in the, the spiny forest that we were working at, and I just have I, I can I can I have a visual of it, and I can see what it's like, uh, and just using that, I can use that in, in different projects, school projects, I can use it uh, really wherever in my life, and I can reflect upon that and just find more answers to things, uh, and I have just a broader sense of uh, the world I live in. Oh, which is amazing. And then four, I realized everyone loves colonians. Uh, I was at this beach shop. They set up shops on the beach, the locals. Um, and, I, um, and, and they were standing there and they were selling little tortoise trinkets. Uh, and I walked up and they all ran at me and they're showing their, their silks. Uh, but I, I said, I don't have money right now. I can't buy that. And I said, but do you want to hear about the tortoises? Uh, and so I started talking just about the tortoises and how endangered they were. And, and five minutes in, I had maybe 30 people just sitting uh, and listening to me. So I was doing a, a lecture there too. Uh, but it, it, that was just amazing, really, to to see that the people there really do care about the animals and have legitimate real respect for them and do really love them. Um, and so. So, for the future of the radiata confiscated and on the island, um, and this is mainly from the AZ Safe Plan, which uh, TSA, Turtle Survival Alliance, um, which is who I went with uh, to the trip, um, and Josh Lucas is kind of pioneering there in some aspects. And the Safe Plan, uh, I recently read through it, it kind of outlines, uh, like, there's, I can't tell you exactly how many, but they're probably 40 different goals that they're trying to hit, uh, targeting kind of education to the public, uh, to the people there, um, and just uh, working with the tortoises, of course. And uh, they actually have a section uh, for the confiscated tortoises, and they do say uh, that within two, three years, they would like to release them. Uh, of course, there are many logistical issues with that, and we do have, before that can be done, um, there are many things that need to be covered, and if it can be done, it needs to be, uh, and like um, Pete was talking about uh, the the stomatitis. That's something that we're going to have to uh, kind of take into consideration. We don't know what's causing it, so before we can release them, we really need to um, figure that out and many other things. Uh, and so that's what kind of Josh Lucas is doing in the country right now, and in, in Turtle Survival Alliance. Um, and so the confiscated tortoises, um, at, the death rate was under 10%, um, and that's what I last heard. So that's. Very, it's pretty good for a confiscation. Uh, that's um, uh, like the Palawan confiscation, I believe, was under 10% as well. And, and uh, everyone worked very diligently in this one and uh, that one as well, as well. And so, for the future of the species in general, um, for all radiated tortoises, I think. Um, if, if the organizations listed below, uh, and I realize some organizations listed aren't actively involved on cons with conservation of the species on the island or even currently, but all have had some effect uh, or are monitoring, and there are many others as well that aren't listed, um, but there, there are many others. And I think 
with, with organizations like that working with the local people and, and working themselves to better the survival and the uh, survival <coughs> prospects of the species, um, and working with the local people and really empowering the locals there, because uh, in the end it really comes down to what the people there uh, really think about the, the animals. Are they food or are they something to conserve? And, and I think if we can work uh, with the people there and we can also implement and learn things and new things and share them uh, and do some of the work ourselves, I think that we can really cause uh, the, the downward trajectory of the species and kind of flip that and make it uh, really an upward trajectory. Um, and I think that's how it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. And so I, I'd like to thank everyone, um, and a special thank you to Russ Gurley uh, and the entire TTP, TTPG for giving me this amazing opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's really it's an honor to share my, this story uh, and just um, and just share uh, sort of that story. Uh, Jordan Gray for lending his time to help me get to Madagascar. Josh Lucas who provided those images uh, that I believe you're the first crowd to actually see um, uh, see them uh, and sharing some information. And uh, my mom and dad who I definitely strive to be like every day uh, who have taught me some amazing things and, and just um, really are role models and amazing people. Uh, so thank you. Any questions, if anyone has anything? You know, this might sound like a, uh, a bit of a stupid question, but so all the tortoise species or turtle species that you mentioned, those are all endemic to Madagascar, correct? Yes, yeah. All So the confiscated ones, those are radiated tortoises. They're native to kind of the southern coast. And all the ones in the beginning, those are all, yeah, native species. Okay. So, yep. Where do you want to be in 15 years? Um, I I I'm I want to get some sort of degree in, in biology uh, and just go. My passion really is to I mean do research for the animals and just help them um, as the most endangered group of vertebrates. I, I think they're really special to me, uh, and I just want to make a difference. Um, and I, I also want to do some veterinary work maybe in the future. So get a vet degree and. I'd be able to do that as well because I like to help. You said these animals are very special to you. When and how did they become so special to you? Is there like a moment that triggered your interest in Yeah, so that's a great, that's a great question. Um, in first grade, I kind of just um, I, I went to a school that really like they they were sort of they. They allowed free thinking. Uh, that's that's what I like to say. Uh, they didn't force you to think in a specific way. Uh, and I kind of just picked up a little book uh, on my way home, and it was about it's it was turtles by uh, Melvin and Gilda Berger. I still remember. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, but um, I just picked that up and. Uh, I just started reading it. I think as a first grader, I read that for about two hours, which is pretty amazing as a first grader. Uh, not many will do that. I was just really interested, um, and I just kept looking through the literature. And I kind of got into it through the literature. A lot of people, I think, get into it because they live, they have them in their backyard, and um, or they keep them. I kind of got into the whole world of research through literature uh, and just captive keeping as well. So that's kind of how it began. And, just took off. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, just wanted to say thank you for being an incredible example of what young people can really do if they put their minds to it. Thank you. Thank you.
For more information on this and other exciting colonian species, visit theturtleroom.com. Check back every Monday night for new videos from The Turtle Room.